right. Welcome. I think we have some attendees showing up right now. Um, welcome, everyone. Um, we this is our first session on building on Ethereum. Um, <laughs> uh, my name is Shreyas. Uh, I'm for some of my background, I'm the founder of uh, Llama, which is a dashboard to help crypto communities manage their treasury. We have two amazing panelists today, uh, Vebhav and Austin. Uh, both of them are respected devs and educators in the space. Um, so yeah, so, so today's session would be uh, basically an overview of uh, getting started with Ethereum. Um, you don't have to have any prior experience with Web3 or Ethereum. Um, many of you don't, and that's, that's totally fine. Um, and then this is actually one of our four um, virtual events. Um, we're gonna have another event on social crypto, uh, DeFi, and a final event on uh, careers in crypto. So um, yeah, so to get started, um, maybe Austin, if you could just give a brief intro to your background and what got you interested in uh, crypto and then Webev can go after that. Hi, I'm Austin Griffith. Yeah, I got into uh, Ethereum a few years ago and it, just just seeing my first smart contract just really got me super excited. Understanding what the implications of that were, understanding what the topology of the network looked like. And I started building things, games and random things, hoping something would stick with the community. And it, and it honestly took a long time. I built, I built probably eight things that I thought were really cool before the community thought one of them was cool, right? So, and, and that and that that eventually was like meta transactions and burner wallets and stuff like that. But now I'm doing uh, a lot more like education, mentorship, building tools, and uh, kind of helping other builders in the space get their footing. Great. Hey guys, I'm uh, Babu. I bunch of uh, research I'll do stuff uh, when I did like three years ago and there was this, like just one solidity uh, tutorial out, out there. Uh, is my audio all good? Yeah. All right. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, so start uh, from from there, built a bunch of stuff and then CryptoKitties uh, started going really viral. And I thought, like, oh, what is even happening? And I started looking into the uh, CryptoKitties code base, and I found that really interesting that, you know, someone could build the stuff and people would go crazy about it. And uh, since then, I'm hooked. Awesome. Um, good. Yeah, and I, I think now is especially an exciting uh, time to enter crypto. There's always these waves uh, that gets people in. Probably the last wave was 2017. So it's, yeah, it's, it's awesome to see. We now have 77 people on this uh, call. So it's, yeah, it's awesome to see sort of a revived interest again. Um, <laughs> uh, great. I'm gonna, go turn, I'm gonna turn off my ETH2 node. I feel like it's just choppy enough. Like you guys are choppy enough that I bet my video and audio is choppy. Give me, give me like 20 seconds and I'm gonna go turn this guy off. So he quit sucking on my bandwidth. Yep, sounds good. Um, so Weber, why don't you probably get started with some of the best resources or advice you would give to someone just to get started on um, building on Ethereum? Yeah, for sure. I uh, hope Austin did not get slashed, but uh, uh, sharing my screen now. It'll be, it's a slow bleed. It like slowly, you build up and then if you turn it off, it slowly bleeds for a little bit. So it's no big deal. It's worth having the bandwidth. Paying, yeah, paying for crypto ed education. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so one thing that I always uh, talk to people about uh, when they come up to me and say, hey, I, I, I like really want to learn more about crypto uh, stuff, like what is a smart contract, uh, how, do, how to like actually find projects that I want to write. Uh, so the first thing I say is like, go look at a Yaxi20 token and then just go at this website called Git gitcoin.co and this is basically like a decentralized uh freelance marketplace so projects like put up bounties here and you can complete them and uh, can get a bounty and can learn more about how to build on ethereum so this is this is how uh, i really recommend people getting 
into the space and that is by building stuff right so uh once you like really start looking into code and you uh see hey like uniswap does like a billion dollars worth of volume in one day and then you go uh google uh uniswap github and you just see the code and the actual work is being done in like just 10 lines it blows your mind and you want to learn more so that's that's how i recommend people is uh do bounties and read other people's code and obviously write more code there's a good question in the chat about uh prerequisites like mandatory prerequisites and and it says for ethereum but i think that means like for building on ethereum right because just like participating in ethereum the prerequisite is you have a private key right like that's the coolest thing and an internet connection like you could you don't have to have anything you can be anyone anywhere in the world and, and participate in ethereum but if you want to build on ethereum you probably need a little bit of programming skills like javascript python uh probably some app building skills like some some front end like i not everybody is a front-end dev. Not everybody is a back-end dev. Some people are just uh, working on contracts and contracts alone. Uh, then there's lots of people working on just the front-end. But my particular secret sauce is taking that, uh, taking that contract and hooking it up to the front-end and kind of iterating on that in parallel. And, and to do that, you will need both, you know, a little bit of JavaScript skills, kind of understanding a little bit of back end -y stuff, and a little bit of like JavaScript front-end React stuff too. But not too much. It's not an, it like just enough to be able to work your way through a for loop and, and kind of trace your way through a React hook, right? There's not a ton of programming needed, but, uh, and, and, and I'll get into, I guess maybe I could show my, uh, uh, the uh, resources, right? And that would lead to ETH builds, which kind of talks about maybe you don't need to have programming skills totally, but it, it's still, it's still good. And that would be so okay so ETH build is what I was talking about there you there are ways that you can kind of just wire stuff up and still like orchestrate transactions and and make things uh, kind of trigger on the chain or read things from the chain and that's uh, with ETH build and you can go through this just to learn the fundamentals also so if, if you're interested in just kind of like learning how the the kind of the network works, like learning how this stuff works, how transactions work, how hashes work, how key pairs work, uh, even even like leading up to like the cypherpunks in the 90s and the distributed ledgers and how it kind of like wintered out for a while with a Byzantine general problem until we found proof of work and blockchain and eventually I get into transactions and smart contracts. But what you could do is you can just get in here and just kind of like build, like you can just grab you could just grab a key pair, right? And you can generate it and you can use that generated key pair to then uh, kind of talk to uh, a blockchain, uh, you know, using a transaction, right? So there's there's ways that you can kind of drag and drop program, but you'll still need a lot of like information about what, you know, what is Ethereum and how does it work? And this is where I always start, right here on ethereum.org. Uh, there's a great place for developers. Uh, I, if you go to learn by coding, you can find eth.build right there. There's also Remix, which is like a web interface for you to just like bang out some contracts. You could even deploy like, you can deploy contracts from Remix to mainnet. I guess you can do that with ETH build and a lot of other tools too. It's just interesting that you can just go to a website and put a put a smart contract out on mainnet. But uh, from, from ethereum.org, there's tons of tutorials, tons of documentation, uh, but eventually if you're a builder, you probably get to this set up local environment. Lots of great tools. And I think we'll talk about probably all of these sort of in the pros and cons, but the one I'm specifically shilling is, is uh, Scaffold ETH. And we'll get to that in a little bit. Uh, other things to learn. I found this the other day, Capture the Ether by Smarks. This is a really great one. Uh, it's on like Robston, I think. So you'll have to have MetaMask, you hook it up to Robston, but there's a bunch of great uh, tutorials here where you just kind of play through and you're deploying to Robston. Uh, damn, damn vulnerable DeFi is probably a level up from that. It's Python, I think, and it's, or maybe it's, uh, I think it's Viper code actually, but another one, and there's like, there's like five of these, right? There's the Ethernaut, there's crypto zombies. There's a lot of good challenges. And, and sometimes you'll feel like, ah, you know, what, whatever, I can whale those challenges, no problem. Try to go through them anyways, and you'll find blind spots. And, the, and it should be fun to do that stuff anyway. So, okay, let me, let me quit sharing my screen. I'll send it back to you guys. That's just my stack for getting, oh, one more thing, one more thing, one more thing. Uh, Solidity by example. This is another good one. Solidity, so if you Google Solidity by example, 
uh, I think it takes you mostly to the docs, but there's this really, really clean page. Look at this. It's super clean and it has like all these copy and paste examples. If you want to learn about structs, here's how to build a to-do list in Solidity. You can copy and paste this right into scaffold ETH and go. And there's even like, you can learn from attacks. Like here's, here's how to set up re-entrancy. So cool. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> you guys. <laughs> Great. No, that, uh, that, that was awesome. But Reba, do you have anything, anything to add to that? Uh, so uh, there, there are all of these like buzz buzzwords in the in the space that people just like throw around, and uh, there is this uh, website called Eat Hub. Uh, so a uh, lot of times, all of these buzzwords are explained very nicely there. So that's that's a good good place too. There's a couple consensus repos. I don't have the exact yeah. exact link, but consensus has a couple of repos that are just like someone sat down and compiled all the information <laughs> they could find. And it's there's a lot of good stuff there too. Yeah. Awesome. Um, great. So yeah, maybe now we could get into showing your stack and just what, what you use to build on Ethereum. Um, and especially a, a bunch of folks are uh, gonna do a hackathon. So this would be especially uh, relevant as people are getting started. So um, let's see, uh, Austin, do you want to go first and then Peva? Sure. Yeah, for sure. Uh, I guess I'll steal the screen share back then. <laughs> uh, someone was asking if we could share these links uh, in chat. I I'll share I'll share some of these when I get back there and paste them in. Uh, let's see. So I wanted to dive, I, I guess we can look at ETH build just for a second. I think that uh, in terms of understanding the fundamentals, it's good to get in here and just kind of understand what a key pair is, understand that like to, to participate on this network, you don't have to sign up for anything. You don't have to have anybody's permission. You basically just need to kind of shuffle shuffle a deck of cards, really. This, this randomness, you just generate this entropy and using this entropy, your address is derived from that. And that is your, your public address that people could send money to. And you just use this private key to sign uh, messages, you, you're just basically signing some kind of thing that says, you know, send five to Austin, right? Ooh, I like the Z. Okay, so and then you sign that, and that goes across the network, right? And uh, that goes with a signature, so everyone sees your intent plus some signature. And then on the other side, somewhere that that can go through any kind of insecure network. On the other side, they can use uh, cryptography to derive who signed that message and make sure it was you. So really the 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 two and the a value are all in here, but the from address is derived from your signature. And if anything changes here, then then everything is going to fall apart down the line. Oh, that was weird that oh, I can't change it. Here we go. Let's do this. Let's make let's make let's yeah yeah yeah, here we go. Let's disconnect that text box and then let's change this to that and then let's drop this in here and we should see the, yep, that address changed, right? Any little change to any of this and the cryptography kind of falls apart and you get oh, maybe it's not a valid signature now. There we go. <laughs> so so uh, this is just kind of explaining, you know, you you don't have to uh, uh, really know a ton about programming to get in here and start playing around. Like, let's go, uh, let's go see what block uh, mainnet is on right now, right? I can bring in a blockchain. If I don't set anything, it's just going to be mainnet. If I want to know what block mainnet is on right now, it was trying to take it from Goya. That's kind of funny. It's on uh, like 904 or whatever. And so this guy over here is probably on about uh, what, like 830. <laughs> it's it's behind a few blocks now, right? So so you can use this to kind of poke around. You maybe you wanted to find your balance, right? So what you would do is you would plug an address in here. Uh, let's see. If I do AustinGriffith.eth, I'm going to need ENS, right? Oops. Cool. And then if I plug that in there, that should give me an address. There we go. And if I go grab my address here and go grab a balance, hopefully it tells me that there we go. I got 2.2 ETH. Awesome. So uh, let's see. Uh, what else can we dive into? In So there's just like a ton of things, uh, QR code readers, IPFS, uh, a lot of cryptography. You can technically uh, encrypt and decrypt with that private key, but it's uh, not meant for that. 
uh, you can look into the transaction pool. You can see the transactions that are like waiting to get mined. And there's just a lot of control stuff, right? Once you, once you get in and you start looking through all these projects, you can watch me run through it on YouTube, or you can just load it into your world here. So this is me showing off the Byzantine general problem. We've got General Bob wanting to attack at dawn, and he's trying to find leading zeros. Basically, all of his soldiers are working really hard trying to find a hash that has leading zeros uh, from his attack at dawn plan. And that lets him use proof of work or proof of soldiers, really, proof of ability to wage war to show the other generals when he wants to attack. And that's that just is helping how we provide consensus across the network. And all of these things are down here in the tray. You can load them up. There's a lot of cool things to check out there. Uh, and yeah, I, if, if you want to get the fundamentals down, I would suggest just going to eField and grabbing this first video. There's like a playlist. It should be slightly entertaining. Uh, OK, now, once you've got the fundamentals down, once you understand what is up and you're ready to build an app, I recommend Scaffold ETH. I've put together, and you can get to Scaffold ETH right here from ethereum.org with set up your local environment. And we'll talk about some of these other ones uh, later. Scaffold ETH uses Hardhat and React. So uh, in the front end, it's, it's, uh, it's mostly React, but then I put in a bunch of components and stuff too. The, the whole thing is just a repo that you can clone. And uh, I've already installed it just because it takes a little bit. I didn't want to use up all the bandwidth, but I'm going to kind of start from scratch here. I'm going to do a yarn start, which is going to fire up my dev server. I'm going to do a yarn chain, which runs my hard hat blockchain. And it also fires up some local wallets, right? Which will be used for the faucet. And then I'm going to bring up a third <laughs> terminal, launching a rocket here, and we're going to go yarn deploy. Okay. And so everything is here for you. It's set up. It's going to have a smart contract and it's going to have an app and it's going to have them all wired together. So, so what happens is you, you can yarn deploy whenever you want, and you're going to get a fresh contract in the front end. And this, uh, this app is going to auto an update to whatever you change in your contract. So let's see here. Let's dive into this a little bit. Let me grab, let's see, let's grab some code and look at it here. All right, cool. So let's just look at the makeup of this thing a little bit. It is, uh, it'll have three main packages and really the, the two most important files, and I wish I could zoom in on this a little bit. I don't think, no, that's gonna do that. You, you've got your, your and oh, by the way, all of this that I'm explaining is like right here, like pretty, oh, there's solidity by example. Let's grab those two while we're at it. All of this is like pretty right in the readme. Just go to the readme and follow it. It explains it perfectly. But you've got your smart contract here. You've got your front end here and you can iterate. So let's just see what this smart contract is doing at first and poke at it. So there's a purpose and then there's some set purpose function. And we, we even have this cool console log here, right? So let's, let's redeploy that one more. Uh -oh. Let's redeploy that one more time. Yarn deploy. Watch this contract address. We'll see that uh, update. Okay, awesome. So now we're ready to interact with our contract for the first time. One thing I want to explain is uh, just accounts. If I open up an incognito window and I take it to localhost 3000, we're going to see another account. See how, see how uh, we're both talking to the same smart contract, but we have these different addresses in the top right. So we're different players in the game. So let me just go ahead and grab some gas from the faucet. I just hit that button. Another way you can do it is just copy your address and paste it in down here. But now we, we have, I have these two kind of actors on this network, right? And they're both talking to the same smart contract. Let's even like Let's copy this guy's address. And this is why uh, Scaffold ETH is nice, is there's a lot of components built in for you. Watch this wallet component. If I want to uh, you know, send a dollar to Vitalik.eth, it's, it's going to give me the blocky preview. It's going to resolve the ENS. It even resolved the reverse ENS there. And then instead of me having to put in the Ether amount here, I'm just going to send it $1, and it's going to figure it all out and send him a dollar of testnet and then give me some feedback there that it, that it fired off. And that local feedback is like good for local stuff. But when you go to any production network, you'll see block native slide in there and it'll be a lot prettier display. Same thing with this. This is kind of, we'll pull this out in a little bit and, and uh, we'll build a real UI. But for now you get like this nice scaffolding set up for you so you understand what's going on. Okay, so let's see. Uh, oh wait, I was gonna send this guy, I was gonna send this guy some money from this guy so we can see it happen. Just cause it's fun to uh, see that uh happen let's see so let's go to this guy's wallet let's send it to this guy and let's send five dollars 
There we go. So we should see $5 send across here. There we go. Good. Okay. Now, if, if we want to interact with the contract, we both have our private keys. We both have ETH. We're ready to interact. If I say, hello world, and I send this, it's going to craft a transaction. It's going to send it to my contract. Now, if we go over here, we can read that, right? Both players, everyone can see that. It cost me money to, to make that transaction, but now that value is stored in that contract. Something really cool happens over here too. If I say hello world again, it's 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 funny because in most programming circles, if I told you that console log was, was like <laughs> the best thing ever, but we have console log now in smart contracts and you can go look at that hard hat terminal, that yarn chain terminal and you can see oh like that address proposed that okay so if i'm in my contract and I'm, i've got a bunch of weird math going on and it seems like it's like rounding i'm getting a rounding error and something is messing up throw a console log in there and then watch your your biddler terminal and you should be good to go okay now let me show you let me really highlight where this starts to show off so if i and i do this same, <laughs> i do this same i should get a better uh uh display of how this works but i'm going to add a uint counter and I'm going to create a function decrement that's public that just takes that counter minus minus, right? Very, 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 very simple programming. But watch how this iteration loop works. And this is what it's all about is being able to tweak my solidity, see it in the front end, interact with it in the front end. And look at this. Now I can call this decrement function already and I can prove to myself what's going to happen when I underflow a uint eight, right? It rolled to 255. So, so you can kind of like play around with those things. And by the way, if you go to solidity eight right here and you'll update your config file here, it will catch that safe math and, and boot you out or it will catch that underflow. So solidity eight doesn't allow you to do that. Okay, uh, if we could set up an ownership model here, so our set purpose only allows the owner, maybe it might be cooler, turn it instead of making it like this, this announcer where only one private key is allowed to set stuff, maybe make this payable and set up a require statement in here. So we, we require them to like send some value, right? Message.value is greater. By the way, message.value is one of those globally available units that we found in one of those links from the, from the repo. The other repo is there. Uh, and so we could like make sure this person has at least like 0 0.001 ether or we'll tell them it's not enough. And there we go. So let's go ahead and ship that off. And we should see a new field update in, uh, in our front end over here that allows us to add value to that, right? So now I can say hello world, but I have to pay some like amount of ether and watch this. So I have to take it from ETH to way, right? The machines want it in way. They don't want to F around with floating point math, but the humans, right? Humans want to see it here in case there's an extra zero. We want to notice that right away. Machines, they want to see it like this. We hit send, we pay for that. And something really neat has happened here. Our contract actually has earned value, right? Now our smart contract is holding value and we can't even stop it at this point. So this contract is deployed, it's out there. It's not really, it's on a local network, but we could change one thing and deploy it. But now we have this unstoppable contract that is uh, uh, available for anyone to get in here and buy, uh, pay, pay money to set the purpose for some reason. <laughs> so, so just diving in a little tiny bit more, uh, there's an example UI for you. So, so once you get your app kind of working, obviously you don't want your end user to have to do this clunky nonsense of multiplying it times 10 to the 18. So you'll eventually build that into your UI. And I've got in here and I've showed you how you can listen to events, how you can set up buttons for, I think this third button actually sets the purpose and pays some value. There we go, we see the event trigger. You could still set purpose here, but it's gonna tell us not enough because I don't have that sending value. But we're tracking the purpose, we're, we're uh, setting the purpose, we're displaying all sorts of different components. Uh, and, and also there's, there's these four buttons here that show you like the four different ways you can make transactions. Uh, once, once you're finally like ready to go to production, you, you go over here, you change this to whatever network you're ready to deploy on. You'll do a yarn generate and create a deployer account. And that's all this stuff is in the repo, follow the repo exactly. But then you just do a yarn deploy and your app goes out and you go over to the app.jsx, this other main component uh, right here. And you point that at your public network and you do a yarn build and you do a yarn deploy and you are a yarn like S3 or IPFS or yarn surge, wherever you put your static site and you ship that out to the front end. And basically you've deployed a full like working app to a network and other people can get in and interact with it. 
Awesome. I think I probably went a little bit over time there, but hopefully that is Scaffold ETH. That's uh, that's here for uh, anyone. You just search Scaffold ETH, grab it right out of the repo, follow the instructions right out of the repo, and uh, good luck. Hit me up. I'm around. <laughs> I'll, I'll hand it off. Sorry, that probably went a little bit longer. I'll, I'll check questions and post uh, links in for the next step. It, uh, that was great. I, I, just a quick uh, question. You um, you covered hard hat um, a little bit. Can you just talk about uh, just what that is and the alternatives? And I think you're, you're a fan of what hard hat does. So just why that's useful. Yep, exactly. So I think it's yeah, hardhat.org. So hardhat, I think they call themselves a task runner, but hardhat is, I mean, it is a task runner, but it has a compiler and they've, they've rebuilt it in a way where when, when you are, when you have, when you have a problem with your contract, which you inevitably will, you'll have a lot more introspection into what the heck is going on if you're using hard hat first truffle. And I think that it's just been, they, they've just worked a little bit harder on dev experience. They've spent more time understanding what it's going to be like for a developer to run into certain problems. And they've tried to make the tooling more intuitive. So they're both great though, right? Truffle and hard hat, use what works for you. I think that, that should be like a, a key of all of this is like, even if all of the the talking heads with bow ties are telling you to one use one tool use the tool that gets the job done use the tool that gets you to the finish line so so hard hat is for compiling it's for running scripts it's for running testing it's for orchestration a lot of the like back end stuff and i use hard hat for the back end and then i end up uh using react uh for the front end and i think both of these are available here too right we've got hard hat here and we've got truffle here and as you can see like truffle has nine thousand stars it's been around for a lot longer so you know, use what works best for you. Great, thanks, Austin. That was that was awesome. Um, Beba, do you want to go? Yeah, for sure. So, uh, let me quickly share my screen. So, so a, a bunch of people when they you know uh, start and they want to uh, fiddle around with more Ethereum stuff. They're like, what what new language should I know to interact with, let's say a smart contract, right? So I just wanted to show, show around what all libs we have in all the different languages, uh, just to like sort of tell, tell people that you can come from any, any sort of language background and still find Solidity or interacting with Solidity contracts easy enough, right? So I think if, if, uh, if you are coming from like a Python background, then you might start with, there is this uh, EVM based language called Viper. It is definitely not the most widely used language, but for people coming from Python, it's, it's a little bit easier to read and a little bit easier to get used to, right? So once, uh, so this is like a fun uh, tutorial and you can like build your own Pokemon and stuff. Uh, all in Viper and it sort of gives you everything you you might need to build a smart contract, right? So it's a, it's a really well written tutorial. Um, so, so a smart contract will be written in Viper and you can interact uh, and you can interact with a smart contract using this uh, Brownie. So Brownie is one of the uh, Python based libraries that is used to interact with uh, smart contracts. Smart contracts can be e either in Solidity or Viper, or there is this other language called uh, Yule. So don't uh, any any smart contract can be in interacted via any of the libs, right? So people uh, people who only know Python might might find ETH Brownie to be a good starting point, right? Uh, Austin has all already talked a lot about hard hard hat, but I just like. Uh, go go through with it quickly so it it definitely has the best documentation i would say amongst all the, all the libs out out there and you can do a bunch of stuff uh austin already showed off console.log so yeah it's it's hard to believe but uh, we just got console.log and it's it's extremely nice uh i i posted a tweet on in the in the chat and yeah that's that's what i feel about hard hard hat it has mainnet forking right so so what mainnet forking means is like 
let's say your your friend you know deployed a contract on ethereum mainnet and he says hey uh, i just deployed a new contract on ethereum mainnet how uh, like check it out uh, but you open the contract on let's say ether scan you go to read contract oh by the way this is how easy it is to like read or write to any contract on this website called ether scan you just like copy this address you go over here it takes you to this page you can see all the transactions that are trying to interact with this contract uh, you go to the contract page you can read the source code directly you can interact with the with the functions in the contract that is deployed also you can like write stuff to this contract right so your this imaginary friend has you know sent his newly deployed contract to you and you want to play around with it but you don't have any main editor and you know your uh, the the contract isn't worth like spending your actual money on so you go to you you, you use this tool called mainnet forking and you sort of like copy the that same contract on your local uh, node so local node is just like a like a testing server you run locally and your con and this mainnet contract will be copied on to that uh, uh, local server and now you can like directly interact with it for free basically so th this is an amazing like testing tool console.log is amazing yeah so my recommendation or my stack for doing solidity or ethereum de de development is using uh, 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 type uh, waffle and hard hat, right? So, why I really like using type TypeScript is uh, because it basically shows me what uh, arguments the solidity function is ex expecting, and sort of prevents me from like weird string to big integer bugs or things things around that. So, I definitely uh, say use hard hat or truffle or mm, some. Type 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 thing and uh, write your first solidity contract and try to interact with it from JavaScript. And if you know uh, Golang or Rust, then there is ethers rs. Uh, this is a Rust based lib. And if you do some, uh, let's say Golang stuff, then there is eth client. Uh, so the the point is basically there is a lib in every language and no, like learning JavaScript should not be one of the uh, things that keeps you from doing Ethereum dev stuff, right? So yeah, uh, the uh, this is basically uh, what I use on a daily basis. Uh, I wanted to quickly show you like how how a smart contract looks on uh, Remix. So Remix is this like web ID. So you just like copy paste this URL in your browser and it opens up this. And I, I have this basic uh, smart contract over here, but uh, you you might have something else. Let me let me find out the easiest one. I, I, I think this is the easiest one for now. So uh, so the contract looks like it's it's really simple because it actually is. And like uh, Solidity in, in general is like JavaScript based. So it's Easy, easy to read, right? Uh, so I haven't in, interacted with uh, Remix in a bunch of time. So I'm missing a lot of uh, plugins. So basically you can go over here and like activate plugins. So I need to deploy and run transactions for sure. So I'll add this. Then I need to, let's say, uh, hmm have a lint, uh, so I need to have a compiler, right? So I'll add that. Uh, so yeah, uh, there are a lot of plugins over here. So I basically have this contract and if I press like control S, it will try to compile it. So it's currently compiling this cpc.sol contract. Don't, uh, don't worry about what this contract does at the moment. Uh, so it takes a bunch of time to compile. So this deploy and run transactions panel, it, it has a JavaScript VM in the browser itself. So once the contract is done compiling, you'll you'll see it appear here and then you can deploy it and play around with it, right? Let's, let's wait for it to get deployed. Meanwhile, 
Meanwhile, there's this uh, amazing uh, resource by uh, A16Z called Crypto Startup School. And they have a bunch of videos. And these are really well done, well explained. And uh, I would definitely say uh, check them out. I'll, I'll post the link, uh, post, post my session. Um, I'm not sure if... How about, how about type right. chain? I heard TypeScript so, in there. Any type chain? I don't know the difference between TypeScript and type chain, but I think type yeah. chain like generates your bindings or something. Yeah, like yeah. That. Cool. Yeah, yeah. So uh, type, type chain is like TypeScript uh, based thing. Uh, so it basically uses uh, TypeScript mm -hmm. internally. So what it does is if you give it a smart contract, it creates TypeScript bindings for it, right? And now you, you can just be like, contract dot your function name and just put in your arguments and it will just throw it uh, to the Ethereum mainnet, right? So it says my contract compiled, but it has an error or something. Uh, yeah, okay, uh, let's, yeah. Basically, uh, Remix is something that we should, like you, you should check out before, uh, if you want to write quickly smart contracts or something. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll stop sharing now. I'm happy to answer any questions in the chat. Awesome work. Um, can you maybe walk through a project that you're working on now or have worked on and just how how some of these things, um, you know, actually, um, you know, work with, with the project that, that you've actually done? Right, right, okay. So I'm uh, working on this thing called uh, Hubble, so it's like a layer two optimistic rollup. Uh, so I'll, sh yeah. So it's like a layer two optimistic rollup. So it basically allows people to like perform transactions very quickly. So the current Ethereum uh, block time is like fifteen seconds. So if you like pay for, uh, so if you want to buy a coffee, you have to wait there for fifteen transactions for your coffee to get in your hand, but we we want to build this L2 infrastructure that allows people to like transfer asset very quickly. So I'm currently working on this. Let me quickly move, move to my terminal and show you like how, how I deploy contracts, right? So yeah, all right. So I, I basically use hard hat here. Yeah, so you can see I use type chain a lot. I use hard hat uh, and ethers. Ethers is my absolute favorite. I, I tend to use it everywhere. Uh, so uh, my, my stack over here would be hard hat, ethers, type chain, etc. Yeah. Uh, so here's how you start like a local uh, simulator node. Right, you just do npm. Actually, let me do the actual command instead of my script. Yeah, so it just you you just do npx hard hat node, and it start like a and it starts like a simulated Ethereum node. So it creates like this uh, twenty uh, random Ethereum private keys, and you have these. Uh, and you write some deploy scripts. So deploy scripts is basically in like, how exactly do you want to deploy your smart contracts in, in what order, what libraries do you want to attach and so on. I, I won't make it uh, a lot complicated, uh, but this is like a complicated project. So it seems uh, hard to do, but, but if you look at it closely, it's, this is just deploying one contract. So it's actually pretty simple and you just do npm run deploy or okay so i was telling you guys about type chain so this is how it looks like so this will compile all all my contracts uh, right this compiles all, all my contracts and creates uh, the typescript bindings for it and now i can just do npm run deploy and this will basically deploy all my 
smart contracts locally on my simulated Ethereum node, right? And this is ex extremely fast. We did not have this tech, I, I think, six months ago. So due to like this new EVM by hard hard hard, things have become really, really fast for us. And now all of these contacts are deployed and we can directly interact with them on any of the other local uh, apps we, we want to build. Right. Great. Um Cool. Yeah. Thanks for uh, walking through that. What would you say is something that you wish you knew before you started your um, Ethereum journey? Uh, I would say I I wish I I basically knew that you you had to call up prove on the ERC twenty token before interacting with the contract. <laughs> so so that's like a big gotcha in the whole e ecosystem. But uh, but we seem to have gotten a bit faster. The, the approved pattern, is that what you're talking about? It's so yeah, clunky. Yeah, yeah. I can't believe, I can't believe we still, we were, I was talking about that with a friend last night. The, the approved pattern is such a pain. And and by the way, builders, get in and, and learn about this. Go, go in, build a token, build a vendor that will sell the token, and then uh, set up the vendor to buy and sell the token. And when the vendor will buy a token back, what has to happen is the user who holds the token has to first approve the vendor to take the token. Then he has to call second function on the vendor contract that goes out and gets the token and grabs it and then does some work. But seriously, like work through that on your own because it's such a good like just mental model to get through because the user experience is gonna be awful for the end user and you have to figure out how to make that work. <laughs> yeah. What would uh, your answer be asked? For things, things I wish I knew. So, so first of all, uh, the Dunning Kruger graph, right? Uh, I I shot up that thing, learning about it. I went down the rabbit hole and learned as much as I could, and got to basically what would be the top of the Dunning Kruger at the beginning. And I thought I knew everything about Ethereum. I thought I was going to build the next app that was going to be make me a millionaire. And then and then there's like the slow travel down. If you if you look at that curve, it sort of does this. It goes up and then it goes down and then it comes back up, right? And and this is this is your knowledge over time and how smart you think you are, right? You think you're you think you're super smart when you get in and you learn all this stuff because it's so complex and it's there's such a learning curve sometimes to really like get through everything and understand like the full mental model of what's going on. And so be careful at the top of that peak thinking that you are you are ready. You're not ready. You need to keep building and you need to keep learning. And I mean you're always ready to get in and start building. You're you're not going to deploy a $20 million platform at this point, you're gonna deploy it probably over here, right? And you need to work through all of that stuff. Other things, the community is very decentralized. You can think you have the thing to show off, the 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 tool, the uh, NFT platform. There's there's going to be other ones. There's going to be other people. You you can shill them the most you want, and some people will like it, and some people won't. You do have to kind of shill. You have to show things off. You have to have tough skin too. This is an adversarial network, right? Every it's try to think of it like a network of jerks that are all like incentivized to be able to work together, right? So so there's a lot to it, and and all, obviously. Ethereum is also full of unicorns and rainbows. So there's always a happy side too. But remember that curve, remember we're decentralized, uh, go open source, right? Like there's so many awesome open source projects that you can go contribute to. If, if you're working on something and you're having a problem, push it up to a repo and send it to me in a, in a DM and I can pull it down and, and we can work through it together, right? So yeah, the, the, the space is very decentralized and there's a lot to learn. And uh, yeah, I, <laughs> I wish I would have known how, how not smart I was at the top of that curve. <laughs> Uh, related to that, what would you say are um, applications that you can build on Ethereum and what are applications that Ethereum is not suited for? And, um, you know, uh, just if you can also just give some project ideas, like what, what do you think would be cool to build right now? That's, yeah, that's a wonderful kind of kickoff point. So, so you have to know that like block times are going to be 15 seconds. You're not going to be building a game where like movement is, is on chain, right? But you can find fun ways to get around that. <clears throat> so uh, knowing, knowing that you're going to be firing these transactions, you could do something like in, in my game Galleass. So I have this game Galleass.io. You, you send a transaction to put the sales up on your ship 
And now your ship just sails with each new block that gets mined. So you do have movement in the game and the game is able to track this stuff on chain, but it's uh, in, a, in a totally different way, right? One transaction to put up your sails, one transaction to put, to put down your sails and go fishing or whatever. But th that workaround is, is like a mental shift that you have to make when you get in, right? So you're gonna have slower block times. Storage is gonna be super expensive, right? When you're, when you're storing something on chain, it's like the most expensive action you can do on Ethereum. So you wanna be storing as little as possible, basically only store the little bit that you need to be uh, kind of executing on. Like if, if you need to take a vote, you need to count all the votes of your users. If you can find a clever way to do that with a mapping and have everyone just submit the, the, the users and you sort through it, it's gonna save you a ton of gas and you kind of have to get over those mental models. Storage, speed, cost is another thing, right? Uh, we're, we're looking for, for L2s. You can see a degentrification happening on, on Ethereum mainnet where it's pushing users out and small NFT purchases, small game purchases, uh, all of that stuff is getting pushed to side chains and layer twos. And so be, be aware of those and be good at building on those. Um, what are other gotchas? I, anyone wanna jump in here and add, add other gotchas from the network? Eva, do you have anything? Randomness, everything's deterministic. You can't do random unless you do something like, uh, like a commit reveal. Uh, if you want to get like data, if you want to get like outside data, you have to bring in an Oracle and Oracles are tough because they have to kind of like, if, if your contract is executing exactly the same on thousands of different nodes and you need to update based on the temperature, that temperature has to be exactly the same for everyone, which means like you have to use a very complicated Oracle to figure out what that is. So also like off-chain data is very hard to do. Right, yeah, uh, off this, like basing off what you just uh, said, like, like I was uh, initially, I, I was trying to do supply chain stuff and it turned out it's extremely hard to do so, right? Because people like so in uh, so it's hard to get data of the network trustlessly into the network and that is exactly where things like oracles come into the play but using oracles is extremely uh, complex and costly and you should basically try to build everything on this uh, single network and this is how like there is this uh, token exchange called Uniswap. It does not rely on any oracles. Still, it uh, is a great venue for uh, swapping tokens. And you should definitely read more about it and you'll love how it works. Uh, yeah, just to add to that, to supply chain stuff in particular, uh, signatures are so powerful. So, so ECDSA signatures, public, uh, public private key pair signatures have been around for like 20 years. And, and really they've, uh, and we use that technology in a lot of places, but they've gotten a lot of attention because of blockchain. But if you think about it, me being able to sign something and that living on some network <clears throat> and, and then propagating and then later on someone be able to prove that signature that's very powerful and for supply chain this doesn't have to go on blockchain as long as you've collected all those signatures right you collect the signatures from all these different places as they land there with a timestamp at the end it never has to be written a chain but you can look back and prove that each place signed that so so even just like signature based stuff and this is how a lot of these like l2s or like state channels work is basically there's two parties going back and forth signing things and at any moment, like one party can, can rage quit and the other one has the last signature and they can submit that to a smart contract and get, and get paid for it. Counterfactual, very good. Someone, someone mentioned Open Zeppelin in the chat. I think we, we haven't mentioned Open Zeppelin probably because it's such, such an obvious layer there, but uh, kind of in the background while we were sitting here, I was writing a token. I'll just share the screen again. So here I've basically, I've brought, I've inherited from Open Zeppelin. So I added one line to my code to import Open Zeppelin. I added this is ERC20. I tell it what I want my token to be named and I mint some and that's it, right? Like I can go over here now. I haven't actually compiled this. So let's see if it's <laughs> actually compiled. Uh, 
yes, okay. And I compiled and deployed a contract, right? So I could point this thing at mainnet and I could hit yarn deploy and I would deploy a decentralized currency. And before Ethereum to do that, you had to build like this whole crypto economically incentivized network of miners that would all proof of work together to kind of build up that long chain. Instead, I can just bang out this, this like 10 line contract and hit deploy. And now over here in my front end, I can go check, let's see, this dude's, this dude's balance of this token should be 10 ether, it is. So yeah, take that, go to the next step, build a vendor, build a vendor that buys and sells, maybe put a price function, go look at an AMM and figure out how price function works. Keep reserves in your vendor of both tokens and show how when I put, like it stays on a balance and when I put some of this one in, it kind of goes like this and you gotta take some of this one off to keep it balanced. So cool stuff. Let me stop sharing here too, there we go, awesome. What else? What else? IPFS for storage. We were talking about how storage was expensive. You can trigger events coming out of your contract and those events can be read off chain. So events are one kind of like cheap storage, but the gotcha there is other smart contracts can't read other smart contracts events. So what you can do is you trigger events when things happen on your smart contract and then that'll be read by your front end to, to display things. And that's considered on, on chain storage, but some other, ooh, the graph, that's another great one. The graph is so good. So uh, using those events, you start getting to the front end where you have to parse like these, all these arrays. Like say I'm triggering three different events and I need to parse them all together to figure out like that one thing. So uh, the graph, it will be a middleware layer that will read all those events for you and then allow you to query just like GraphQL style what is the greatest this thing? And it will just give you that value. And we use that for Nifty Inc. We started, we, we deployed Nifty Inc. It worked. We, we were using just events and you would land on the front page and it would stream through like crazy. And then eventually we would be like, okay, we got to go to the subgraph. And so we built in the subgraph and we built in the subgraph into Scaffold ETH. So with Scaffold ETH, you'll use events for a while, but then when you're ready, you just kind of like turn on a new thing and set up your schema and you've got, and you've got the graph. And IPFS like triggered this whole thing, but IPFS is just a good way to store stuff also. It's content addressable, addressable storage that's eventually going to be incentivized, but it's distributed. So I can take something and I can push it out to a network and other people can hold it for me. And then that I get a hash back. So I get a, like a fingerprint of my data and I can take that fingerprint and I can put that into a smart contract. So everybody can see on chain where they can go to go look that information up on a cheaper storage layer. Woo wee. Happy hey. Bowtie Friday, Love right? What? <laughs> <laughs> Um, I think we've covered a few um, uh, projects like Graph and IPFS. What, what um, and, and I think uh, one of you maybe ever mentioned Uniswap, like if, if folks want to look at projects for references, um, what, what would you say are some of the most, you know, widely used contracts where, uh, you know, with good documentation that, that people can um, look into as references? There's so many. You want, you want to start? I, I let me let me I have like a list here somewhere. You you start and I'll see if I can find my list and and I'll just like wrap them off when I can find them. I'll just say uh, like look at a ERC twenty token and then look at Unistop. And if that does not get you hooked, then ping me. I'll send you more contracts. <laughs> but we'll <laughs> definitely get you hooked. <laughs> Totally. Uh, like flash loans are a neat thing to look oh, at. Like yeah. just in terms of, in terms of like concepts, like flash loans mm -hmm. are really cool. Uh, Reentrancy, front running. Uh, let's see. Uh, commit reveal meta transactions, the proxy yeah. pattern, factories. Like when, when you can have a smart contract that imports another smart contract and then says new that smart contract, it's actually deploying that Factory, contract, yeah. which is so cool, mm -hmm. right? And if you mm -hmm. don't do a new, you say that smart contract and you give it an address, now you're contract to contract, right? It's like talking yeah. to them. Yeah, synthetics, the, the OG uh, yield, yield <laughs> farmers, uh, ENS. You should, you should, as a, as a site, you should go get your name.eth and, and I, <laughs> I will, I will help sponsor some of this. <laughs> I feel like I, <laughs> gas is so expensive right now, but I want everyone, I want those .eth names, right? I don't have my .eth name, but Austin Griffith.eth is, is me. Go get, go get an ENS, check out prediction markets, uh, Gnosis, Augur, uh, collectibles like OpenSea and Rarible insurance like Nexus Mutual and Open, social networks like Peepeth and Akasha, 
games like Sky Weaver, Weaver, Axie Affinity, Crypto Kitties, Galleas, <laughs> my <laughs> my crappy my crappy ship game, Dexes you mentioned, uh, yeah, and then it gets it get, goes down the rabbit hole with DeFi, man. You start getting into vegetable tokens and that's, and that's fine. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but but the TLDR the TLDR there going back to that that Dex, you have to provide some liquidity, right? For for people to be able to uh, exchange on a, in a decentralized way, you need to have liquidity there, or you need to have some curve that's holding something. And so you have to be incentivized to, to provide that liquidity, right? And there are fees. If a token is just going to oscillate and it's just going to ring back and forth, the fees are going to slowly grow. And the people that are providing that liquidity are, are going to get paid a, a small amount. But if things go up or things go down, you have impermanent loss and it's not, they're not, it's not as valuable to provide that liquidity. So what they do is you put in some, some of your reserves, you get a token back, and then you take that token and you lock it up somewhere else and you earn a trickle of another token. And that other token has some other value and, and it helps incentivize you. And that like blew up DeFi summer, right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, Foru Combo, what, I, don't, I don't know how to spell it, but Foru Combo, like Zapper is awesome. Uh, mm -hmm. Zerion, right? Uh, what about leverage? You can get DYDX, Compound and Ave for lending, Maker for the stable coin. Uh, just want to get weird, go check out like uh, uh, crypto voxels, Decentraland, uh, Clovers.network, FOMO 3D. Uh, go go start looking about uh, ETH2, right? How, how you can start staking and, and earning with ETH2. Uh, I love I look at look at these links coming in here. I can just I can just yell stuff off and yell Argent. <laughs> Do we get the Argent wallet? The Argent wallet is really awesome. Burner wallet. <laughs> you don't no. You stop 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 putting links in there. <laughs> You're doing a great job. This is wonderful. Uh, any, let's see. I haven't been watching questions. Let me go. Let me go check the Q and A. Section. Yeah, it'd be good. Maybe if you could, if you could answer some of the questions in the Q and A. Um, I've been answering some of them, but so so when 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 someone says a beginner and they're looking for Ethereum stuff, are they a complete beginner programmer? Because you you should probably just go tackle like make a to-do list in React and write a script in, in JavaScript that, that does something interesting, right? Like, like you don't, you should have like a tiny bit of coding ability just to like separate the mental models and know, you know, you wanna be working on solid ground, right? So I would say if you're brand new to Ethereum, but you're a great programmer, you're gonna be able to pick up a lot of this material we've already given you very quickly. Uh, I, I would recommend uh, like just get into, if you're a good programmer, I would recommend just getting into Scaffold ETH and following the readme and you'll have a dap in an hour and probably most of the mental model. I do, I do like mentorships. So always down to like, just grab a group of people, get on a Zoom and kind of get your local environment set up and, and hack on some contracts together mirror.finance. I haven't really gotten into that one. Let's see. It says provide any task. I'm not sure what that one is about. Windows, Windows works great. Like Windows, uh, Scaffold ETH. I have a Windows machine here and I run through Scaffold ETH on Windows. Same thing. If you're a Windows user, go to that readme, follow the instructions. You'll have to get yarn and, and a couple other things, but it, it's pretty easy to run those down. Public private. I don't know that much about private blockchains. Like I use private blockchains for fun and I know like corporations use private blockchains and I think you know you still have that like credible neutral you know the the chain is very cold and dry and does exactly what it's supposed to and I think that's valuable to have between uh, organizations but I'm I'm all about the public blockchain right I think it's I think that like it's key is it's open source. It's available for everyone. Anyone can participate. Like a public blockchain to me is is so much more powerful. But private blockchains are like fun to play on. And I guess maybe maybe there will be like a gateway drug for for organizations that that will eventually like move to a, a public blockchain. I think um, that's. I think all uh, of them I see in here. Close to nine, but it it'd be helpful if since a, a bunch of people asked this um, in the farm that they filled out just to cover some of the ways that folks can um, build their career in crypto, uh, just how to get started. I think, Vaibhav, you mentioned Gitcoin, which I think is a great place to start, but, you know, internships or uh, full-time jobs, just how do people navigate uh, this space in terms of employment? For, for me, like, 
I built a couple of things and no one cared. And I tried hard and no one cared. Like what, what you have to do is just keep building, be persistent, keep building, keep, keep, uh, and, and remember who knows where you are on that curve, right? You don't know where you are on that curve of knowing everything, right? So just be persistent, be humble, keep building. There's a ton of repos out there you can contribute to, but a lot of times we are so new. We were talking about console log and smart contracts just now. We are so new to the space that there are so many things that haven't been discovered and little things that are interesting. Go find something that's interesting to you. Go learn about it and then write a Medium article that teaches it and 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 get that out to people on Twitter and do that over and over again. But take, take, take a GitHub repo, build something cool, write in the readme, work someone through it, teach other people how to use it and put it out there. And, and there, like, you, there's a lot of different communities that might use that, people might pick that up. Uh, bounties are great, uh, I'll hand it off there. You, you got other good jumping off points? Yeah, uh, so uh, here's a, quick thing right so I, I basically got my first job in in crypto when i was contributing to this thing called wallet connect so it was just like a, a cozy saturday night and i wanted and i was like browsing through open source code and i saw a basic issue on wallet connect and i went down and i sent a pr and a bunch of people who were watching the work that was being done there reached out to me and we had a really nice chat and i got my first internship and yeah, that's that's a really good way to help other people out and help yourself learn more too. So open source, yeah. Uh, I didn't know that story. That's a great example. And I've, I found that uh, these, you know, the, a lot of these communities are very open to uh, folks just actually fixing things, building things like, you know, reach out to people on Discord. Uh, you can lurk on these chats and um, ask people questions if you have anything. Um, you know, people are, we're at sort of an inflection point, at least right now in the space, where people are still very, very open to um, interacting with, um, you know, newcomers and um, even people are just willing to learn. They, everyone's just happy that, that there's interest in the space. Um, I don't know, maybe in many years that changes, but right now I, I still sense that that's the case. Yeah, just to like support more on what uh, Shreyas just uh, said. So uh, basically, uh, a green frog and a dog are one of the top crypto in influencers at the moment. So you know where, where we are coming from. <laughs> yep. That's so good. Yep. Um, we can use all the help we can get. <laughs> keep building, <laughs> keep learning, keep and, and help the next guy, right? Find, find yeah. a path that didn't work well for you and make that path better for the next guy. Exactly, yeah. We're, we're definitely not... Crypto is not that obsessed with credentials, at least uh, now. If you could build things, if you can fix something, you can contribute in any positive way. People are very open to accepting you. Um, good. Uh, any any final things you guys want to cover before we close off? Yeah. So uh, here's my like quick one one minute pitch to devs about Ethereum. Right. Imagine if you could click a button, deploy your contract on a network and go to sleep without worrying that it it might not be able to take the load of a lot of users it it might crash or it uh, it you you you'll have like a 10 20k uh, server costs by the uh, next morning so the amazing thing about ethereum is uh, once the contract is on there it's totally serverless and it does not cost you a penny right so uh, so the cost of experimentation is extremely low and that should help quite a lot. And that, that dev loop, right? Something that I showed off where it was like, make a small, like, like have a setup that has everything you need and just make small changes at first and, and kind of like learn what that does. And also like put it in other people's hands and, and see how they react to it too. There's, there's a lot there just of like playing around just to add to your point, like, when, when I ship that contract, when I, <clears throat> when I deploy that thing, I can't stop it. Like no one can stop it. And there's something, there's something really cool about like deploying unstoppable code. Totally. Um, awesome. Uh, Web, and Austin, this is, this is great. Uh, for everyone who attended, we, our next event is on uh, social crypto. Um, so there's a bunch of interesting things happening with social tokens and 
NFTs um, and creators and communities. And we're doing that on um, Jan 29th, so next Friday. Um, so yeah, uh, let, let Austin and Fairbuff lead the Twitter handles so you can get in touch with them if needed um, after the session. But uh, thanks everyone for joining. I think we've got a, a good number of attendees and welcome to um, Ethereum and excited to see what you all did. Thanks guys. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Happy Bowtie Friday. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Bye guys. See you.